Hey everyone and welcome to my team fighting guide. For the sake of simplicity this video is going to be covering both team fights and skirmishes and what I'm going to do is break this into two main sections for you to digest. Planning and execution. So without further ado let's jump into it. Okay so for planning I'm going to break this up into two parts of its own. The planning phase and then the planning examples where I'm going to show how you should be planning out your team fights. So for the first part of the planning phase, and this can all be done in champ select, what is your general team fight identity for your champ? What type of team fights do they like? What type of fights do they like? Do they like front to back? Do they like looking for number advantages? Do they like looking for picks? Do they want to find engages on priority targets? I'm going to put up a brief summary of champs and the general teamfight identity that they might like to adopt. And keep in mind, this is general, situations can change, but it is helpful to prime yourself going into the game, knowing what situations on paper your champion thrives in. So given that we have a general overview of what we want to look for, now in this game, in these five champs versus the enemy champs, what is our specific teamfight identity? What are you going to be priming yourself to do in this situation? A champion may have different roles in team fights in all different games. Let's say you're playing a champ that loves to fight uh, front to back, but your team composition is a lot about split pushing. And so then you're not going to be able to front to back. In this specific team identity, you might have to choose you know, a side laner to play around instead. Or let's say you're an engager and you're priming yourself to engage on a certain enemy champion. Maybe they have an immobile hyper carry that you really want to prime yourself to look for engage windows on. Or maybe they have a really slippery assassin and you have some point and click lockdown and that's what you want to look to do. So to summarize this point, for the uh, different types of fights that someone might enjoy, what which one do you think is best suited to your team? Which one is going to be the most effective versus the enemy team as well? Okay, so we're going to get more specific as we progress down the planning phase. Now, what I think is important to think about is the important spells to heed. What are you going to be saving your kit for? What are you going to be on the lookout for? Are you playing a disengage champ? Which spells, which champs are you keeping an eye on to make sure that you disengage them? If you're an engaged champ, which spells are you waiting for the enemy team to use? Or which ally spells are very important and you want to factor into how you're going to approach a team fight? So let's just run through a few examples of each of these. Saving disengage for an important spell. Let's say you're Janna, um, you're versus a Rel, or you're versus a Fiddlesticks. You're not just going to be ulting randomly to push away a frontliner or just to heal. You're saving your disengage for those important engage spells. So they ult in, then you can disengage and you can ult them away. And this is going to be very important to keep this in mind, to prime yourself for this, because team fights they're very chaotic, you know, they're very fluid, there's so many variables. If you go in thinking about certain points, then you can just remove a lot of the clutter and you don't have to just react in the moment. You're anticipating those spells and then you can react accordingly. For engagers, maybe you want to look to engage on an immobile carry and you know that they don't have flash. And so that's a really important uh, you know, spell for them to not have. Or maybe you're versus an Azir and you're waiting for him to use his, use his dash. Or for Lucian or Israel to use their dash before you look to commit your engage. Maybe you want to layer your engage with your allies. You know, maybe you have uh, an ally Javan, or you have like a Camille or a Galio, and you really want to wait until you engage when they have their cooldown available and when they're in range as well. So, what are the important spells to just keep in mind? This can be as obvious as a Janna disengaging a roll. It can be as subtle as a Thresh looking to flay away. Uh, a Javan's combo. As long as you head into the game primed with thinking about the right things and what is most likely going to be important deciding factors in a team fight, you're going to be in a much better position. Let's move on to planning phase examples and have a look at these three points in each of them. The general identity, the specific identity, and the important spells to heed. Now I'm not going to show you drafts that are really obvious what you should be looking to do. That would be disingenuous of me. These are going to be situations from my main and from my smurf in solo queue. Now for each of the examples, for simplicity's sake, we're going to be on the perspective of blue side. And so let's have a look at this first game. We are the Renata. Here's our team, here's the enemy team. Let's start with the general identity for Renata, how she wants to approach team fights. Renata is an enchanter and she excels in the front to back, where she can play off of allies and use that ult to really swing fights. However, considering the specific identity for each team now, we have an assassin jungle and assassin mid laner you know, a, a bruiser carry top lane and the enemy team on the other hand, they have a very clear front to back win con. You know, they have front line, they have engaged, they have consistent DPS. 
So this is a situation that we probably do not want to opt in to a front to back. So with that said, the specific identity for this game is probably going to be less around a ramming on mid and a ramming on neutrals in a front to back and more so playing around our assassins, trying to get them ahead, maybe cheating a little bit of tempo, grouping up with them, looking for picks. Even if it's not perfect for our champ's identity, that is kind of what we have to settle on for this game. Moving on to important spells to heed. And so there are a couple of things that I want to mention here. The first is that our Q can, you know, interrupt spells. And so if we want to cancel anything in particular, that's what we would want to look for here. And so the Javan EQ is the main one that comes to mind here. If we really just hold our Q until we see in Javan EQ forwards and then we throw it out, cancel their EQ, that can be very effective. The next is our ult. And so the way that we want to look at disengage ults is we want to wait until the enemy engages and then we can use it, right? And so what are the main engage tools of the enemy? It's the Javan EQing and looking to ult forwards is the set ulting forwards looking to stun everyone afterwards. And so once their frontline starts to use their engage tools, then we can look to press our ult. So loading into this game, I'm priming myself to not necessarily look for front to back 5v5s, but more so to look for picks and skirmishes along with my fed assassins. And whenever a team fight or a skirmish does break out, I have an idea of when I should be looking to use my Q and my ult. And of course, if the situation changes, I am going to be ready to adapt. Okay, moving on to the next example. And here we are Rel. And so let's start with the general identity of Rel. Hopefully this one is pretty clear. Rel is an engager and she excels at finding those, you know, big wombo combo teamfight engages. In terms of how the comps are looking there, we're not going to have to make any big adjustments here. Our team here is more than capable of playing towards what Rel wants to do, right? And finding those teamfights. We have the Lilia that can provide a lot of CC. We have the Lissandra with all of her zone control, the MF alt. And the enemy team does not look like they have many tools to reliably stop what we want to do. And so our general and our specific identity lining up here, great game for Rel. In terms of important spells to heed, there aren't going to be much here. If Lulu is playing exceptionally well and ults my W in a team fight, that's not really something I've experienced. So for the most part, I'm not really worried about any of the enemy tools. An important spell I do want to keep in mind though is the difference between my engage while my MF has ult and when she doesn't have ult can be a very big difference. And so I'm going to be a little bit more inclined to wait to engage when my MF has her ult up. Okay, moving on to the next example and here we are Bard, we're a playmaker. Bard's general identity is he wants to create number advantages, right? He has a very mobile kit. He wants to use that mobility to his advantage, roam around, create chaos, create number advantages, embrace and inject volatility into the game. And thankfully for this game, that lines up with the specific identity for our comp. You know, we have a Graves who wants to play high tempo. We have a Ziggs who is more than happy to just farm uh, by himself. And so I'm not tied into bot. I'm not tied into front to backs necessarily. I can play off of my teammates. And so this is a good game for Bard. Again, right, the general and the specific are aligning here. The important spells part here is a little bit trickier. They don't really have any great targets for me to ult. Let's say they had an immobile mid laner, like a Victor or a Syndra or an immobile ADC, you know, like Twitch or a Felios or something, then I would be really keeping an eye, keeping track of their uh, flash cooldown. Because if those immobile carries don't have flash, then that is really easy for me to look to create picks on them. However, in this situation, there isn't too much to keep in mind. So I do want to look to roam and impact through top mid jungle probably. And Silas, you know, his E dash can be something to keep in mind. So I don't use my Q before he uses his dash. But apart from that, I think there's not too much to take away from the important spells part here. Okay, so here, this is the game that I picked Valkoz. And a draft like this might be a little bit more familiar to someone, uh, you know, in gold or below. And so this draft is an absolute mess on both sides. However, let's just start analyzing it. So general identity for a mage front to back, look to set up camp in mid and just dish out damage consistently, play selfish, make sure that you can provide consistent DPS. Specific identity. So we're gonna run into a, a few issues here. So we can't really play that front to back where a mage really wants to sit behind the front line and just throw out damage. Our Teemo kind of wants to do his own thing in the side lane. Karthus wants to farm up and press R. And then it's just, it's very hard to find a specific identity, right? I think the only thing that we can really take away from this one is maybe our Timo and Yone want to be on side lanes. Our Karthus is waiting to press alt to look for and facilitate a pick in either of the sides. However, Valkos is really going to struggle to move away from mid. 
And so we're either going to decide to have to just, you know, sack our identity and try to roam mid and try not to die in the jungle, or we wait until our side laners get pressure and priority, and then when they move on towards mid, then we can look to achieve our identity. So this is definitely not a good game for Velkos, and that's fine. Sometimes you're going to be in awkward situations, and maybe you're just going to have to change what type of fight you're looking for, or just grin and bear it and try to do the best given the circumstances. Okay, in terms of important spells for this one, so Nunu, when he is using his snowball, that is extremely threatening for a Velkos, and so if we are situated around mid, and we don't have information on Nunu, we might not even be able to achieve anything mid. Same with Ash ult. If Ash has her ult up, then we might have to play very far back. Um, Gragas, you know, if his ult is up as well, there's a lot of long range threat here. So definitely a horrible game for Velkoz, but loading into a game like this, what I'm going to be looking for is to just be situated around mid, but not to look to push ahead too far in the mid lane. I want to respect their engaged tools. I want to make sure that I am never exposing myself to the enemy team's engage, and then I'm just going to hope for the best, find some poke, be very disciplined, and hope that the enemy team makes mistakes, which is practically guaranteed. Okay, so the last example we're going to look at for the planning phase, we are the Rakan here. General identity, he wants to look to set up these team fights, right? He is an excellent team fight engager. He can also embrace a little bit of a faster game pace uh, alongside his mobility and his kit. So general identity, look for team fights, look for skirmishes. Specific identity, this is definitely going to line up here. We have a Rengar who we can play off of with our E. We have a Sejuani and a Nico who can set up a team fight so we can even be a secondary engage. We have a Kaisa to follow up. So great. General, specific, they're aligning. Great game for Rakan. Now let's think about the important spells. And here they have a couple of immobile carries and they really do not have any disengaged tools. So I'm going to be paying extra attention to the flash cooldown of the Syndra and the Draven. And also if there is a fight where they can see me coming from the front, then I want to be playing around Syndra's E and Draven's E because they can disengage my W potentially. So I'm going to be more inclined to be a secondary engage, so like follow up on CC so they can't cancel me, or look to engage from fog so that they don't have time to react to cancel me, or just look to engage when I have flash so that they can't cancel it either. I'm also going to be a little bit more inclined to look for proactivity when my top side has their ults, you know, when Rengar has ult then I can freely jump off of him and follow up. Sejuani, her ult, and Nico, her ult. Being able to follow up on those is going to make fights and skirmishes a lot cleaner. Moving on to execution, and once again I'm going to chunk this into two sections, the execution phase and then execution examples. And so the execution phase, this is situation dependent. You can't do any of this in the loading screen. So the first point to consider, who is out of position? And this could be your team being out of position and then you want to play around them and potentially peel for them. It could be an enemy champion that is out of position and then you want to look to engage on them. It is important to note that although an enemy might be stranded, might be within your engaged range, if your teammates don't have cooldowns or they're not nearby enough to follow up, then they're not actually out of position right now. And so if you're an engager, you want to wait until an enemy is actually out of position and your teammates can follow up. If you're an enchanter, if you're a disengager, you want to wait until one of your allies is actually out of position and then you can disengage their engage attempts. If you're a playmaker and you're looking for number advantaged fights, maybe an enemy showing somewhere on the map gives you an opening to look to force a number advantage fights. This is a question that I ask myself and my teams a lot in my pro playing days. Who is out of position? Are they actually out of position? The next point is cooldown assessment. So this is going to tie a little bit into um, who is out of position. Can my team follow up? Do they have the cooldowns to be able to follow up? Can the enemy team disengage my engage if I am an engage champ? Did they use maybe Jana Tornado or Jana Alt? Do they have their disengage tools still available? Or if you are a, an enchanter, if you want to disengage, then is my team vulnerable? Maybe your Israel just eed forwards and now he is really out of position and you need to make sure that you disengage for him. Did the enemy team recently use their ults at a previous fight and now there's another fight before their ults are back up and so this gives you more confidence to look to fight? Do they have their flashes up? Do we have our flashes up? It is very important to find windows to punish cooldowns in skirmishes and team fights, and it's also important to respect on the windows where you or your team don't have your cooldowns up. And then the last point for the execution phase, fight assessment. How is the fight going? Is it a winning fight? Is it a losing fight? If it's a winning fight, let's chase, let's be greedy and aggressive with all of our decisions. We don't have to necessarily use everything on one. Let's try and kill as many enemies as possible, as an example. 
if it's a losing fight, maybe we just need to disengage. Maybe we need to either sacrifice ourselves or just let our allies die and then just be in full disengage mode. So those are the three main points for execution phase. Who is out of position? And then cooldown assessment and fight assessment. And so it might sound pretty simple on paper, but we're going to have to jump into some examples to really see it play out because this can be a very difficult part of team fighting. Okay, so we're going to go over some execution examples now. I just want to show a bunch of different examples. And for this first game is the importance of cooldown assessment. So let's just go forwards a little bit here. We're trying to pick on Elise and then our Ari gets caught and dies. And so we're kind of in disengage mode right now. So this is also a little bit of fight assessment. We're in disengage mode. Let's try and just minimize and stay alive. And then eventually we'll be able to find that, you know, right moment to re-engage. And so currently they're not necessarily out of position. I also know that Gragas has his E that I need to play around and Elise has her E. So if I am going to find and engage, I need to wait until those cooldowns are down. And then potentially my teammates can follow up as well. So they're chasing, they're chasing. We see the Twitch here. Right now, I could engage, but I don't want to. I know Gragas just uses E forwards as well, and Elise used her E, and so I am starting to look to find that engage, but once they are all fumbling in here. Right now, Elise is juking a little bit backwards, and my Kaisa, as you can see on the minimap here, is starting to wrap around to potentially follow up with her ult. So all of the stars are starting to align here, and then I find that engage on the back end. And then my Graves can follow up, and my Kaisa can follow up, and we're making the best of a bad situation here. Situations like this are going to be very common for engagers in the mid to late game. You're going to have one shot at engaging. You need to be patient but decisive in when you choose to make that engage. So let's watch again here. I make sure I survive here. I could engage right now, but I'll just get my engage cancelled. I could engage right now, but then I would only potentially get two of them and my Kaisa wouldn't follow up. So be patient, wait for that right moment to come, and then find that decisive engage window. Just play it out a little bit. And so this was a really doomed situation and then we get a bunch of kills on the back end and it, at the end it's not too bad. Okay, this is the same game just a little bit later and this is going to be more of an organized 5v5 team fight. And we can get a, you know, a sense of what is going on in this game. They have a very fed Aatrox but their Twitch is especially fed and I know that he used his flash earlier on. I've been timing his flash and so the way that I want this team fight to play out is that I find a window to engage onto their flashless immobile carry. It's also my role as a team fight engager to try and get as many um, enemies in my combo as possible, right? I don't want to just solo initiate onto the Twitch and then the enemy team has a lot of freedom to, you know, prevent follow-up. So I'm going to keep my eye on Twitch. I'm going to keep my eye on potential disengaged tools I need to be on the lookout for, such as Gragas E and Gragas R. So that's going to be the main focus here. And once again, I want to reiterate how important having that patience to pull the trigger at the right time is. If I pull the trigger at any other time that is not the right time, the game... Could go from a win to a loss very very quickly so let's just play it out a little bit here they're looking to potentially siege up through mid and then i'm going to look for an engage through the side here away from the gragas honestly my positioning isn't too important here i could position through here i could position from the front i do have my flash to look for that engage and so i'm being patient i'm not randomly pulling the trigger around here at any time my set goes in initially I see that Gragas uses his E and his R, and then I'm waiting for the Twitch to show up, and then I find that engage. <clears throat> so this could look very chaotic um, from the outside, right? But all I'm thinking about here is don't let Gragas cancel my combo and engage on Twitch with the rest of the enemy team whenever he pops out. So I'm really simplifying quite a complex situation here. Silas uses his Zonyas as well. I can wait for that. Gragas uses his ult there. Twitch pops out. Now's my time to shine. Flash, engage in, and then we one-shot them, and then we just win the game when we were losing pretty hard. As you can see on the back of this fight here, I really am looking at the Twitch. And so Twitch, I can see he's going invisible, he's disengaging. I'm not trying to like chain CC combo with my set on these members. They're not important. Only Twitch is really, really important in making sure I get a one by one here. Their Twitch was the fed member with no flash, you know, in another draft maybe their mid lane is going to be really fed, consistent DPS, win condition, but I assessed who was, who needed to be the target in this game. Alright, moving on to the next game, and here I am playing Jarvan support as an engager, and so I just want to go over a few really quick points here, and this is going to be about assessing um, the state of the fight, you know, fight assessment. Is it winning? Is it losing? How much do we want to get out of our cooldowns? You know, as an engager, 
I say this very often, but you only get one attempt. You only get one rotation of your cooldowns typically, and so you want to make the most of it. So we could say that um, this Warwick here is quite out of position, right? I could just kind of ult him and kill him, but we're really, really far ahead in this game. We have numbers here, and I, this fight is obviously winning. So I want to get as much out of this fight and chase and greed for as much as possible. So I'm running straight past the Warwick here, as you can see. And I assess that Warwick is going to die, and then we can kill Sona on the back end as well. So it's not like this fight was game-changing for this game, but it's a very important concept to keep in mind. If you can assess how the fight is going, should you chase, should you greed, or if the fight is losing, should we disengage and cut the losses as much as possible? All right, same game, just a little bit later. And here I want to talk about if the enemy team actually is out of position and if they're not out of position, you don't want to engage. And so you can see my Talia mid, very low. Gragas, very low mana as well. They're using their cooldowns. And so right now, even though I do have a potential engage angle onto the enemies, they're not out of position. I don't want to engage. No one can follow up. And so I'm posturing, I'm waiting. I know I only get one shot. I'm going to make the most of it. And now my Israel is coming in through here. My Talon is wrapping around on the flank here. And now I choose my time. So now I can engage onto the immobile carries with my ult and then EQ out. My Israel can follow up. My Talon can follow up. And this wouldn't happen if I just like jumped onto the, the Trindamir right now. If I jumped onto the enemy team right now, nothing would happen. All right, let's move on to the next game. I am Janna. I am obviously an enchanter here. And I want to look to play front to back. So I want you guys to just pay attention to my positioning, how I ensure that I am in a front to back situation and that I stay safe and try to peel my team. In terms of how I want to use my uh, Q and my R, my disengage tools, uh, for this game, it's going to be tricky, right? There aren't any big cooldowns that I can re reliably interrupt with my abilities. So instead, what I might look to do is use my R to peel off the enemy team when they jump in and look to really uh, create space for my team. And then with my Q, again, I'm not going to be look on the lookout to cancel anything. Maybe I'm just going to pick a good time to channel it up and get as big of a knock up as possible. Apart from that, I am going to keep my eye out on Nautilus's ult because that is a spell that if it hits me, I can just kind of get one shot. So with that uh, being said, let's have a look at what happens. I'm posturing. I'm not going to face check. I know my role. I know I want to front to back and have my ally front line between myself and the enemies. And then I can play off of them like I am here. And so I don't have, like I said, I don't have anything in mind in particular for my cues to cancel anything. So I'm just going to be channeling them into, uh, you know, chokes to try and knock someone up for a long time. And here, once the enemy team, once their frontline is really trying to commit forwards, now I can use my ult to buy some space, buy some time for us to continue to front to back. Again, I'm looking to just knock up the enemies for as long as possible, stay safe, peel my allies. Unfortunately, on the back end of the fight here, I walk too close to set and then I get pulled in and die. But in terms of how the team fight played out beforehand, I felt like I was able to, you know, achieve that front to back and make the most of my kit. And even if I didn't make the most of my kit, I went into the team fight with a plan. I'm going to play front to back. I'm going to use my ult to create space and I'm going to use my Q um, and channel them in corridors to knock up for a long time. And if you go into a team fight with a plan so that you don't have to just react to everything happening in a chaotic situation, you're going to be in a much better spot. All right, moving on to the next game. This is another Janna game. However, I'm not going to be showing a disengaged team fight situation. I want to be showing a fight assessment situation. And so we're very far ahead here. They have like a troll zone mid, but that's not important. The important point here is assessing that the team fight is going to be winning. And so my Diana, you know, she's quite strong. Um, I'm assessing that this team fight is good for us. And so I'm not, you know, putting all of my spells into ensuring that the Graves dies. I know that my Diana is going to kill here. Then I channel my Q conspicuously and throw it this way to clean up the remaining members afterwards. The faster you assess the team fight, you know, is it winning, is it losing, then the more you can get or the less you can lose a lot of the time. All right, the next thing we're going to look at, I am Bard, and we can just see here that we're really far ahead. Our Aatrox is the win con. And this is going to be a good example of the ebb and flow of a team fight. So what initially happens is that our fed Aatrox gets caught, he's out of position, and so I want to use my whole kit to try and keep him alive so that the rest of us can get here. And so I'm using all of my spells, you know, my locket, I'm portaling in, I'm ulting, and now the fight is winning. And so it went from a losing situation, I'm trying to help my uh, teammate as much as possible, and then we're starting to hard win. And fights can be dynamic, right? Maybe your team makes a mistake initially, it's losing, you want to be disengaging, enemy team starts to overreach and then 
you know, maybe they're out of position, then it's winning. And there's, there can be a lot of ebb and flow. You can see that in pro games as well. So I'm going to show an example of that a little bit later. But this is just a quick example in the solo queue game. We're going to look at another Bard game. But in this situation, we're a bit far behind. And initially, what Bard, you know, wants to do is look for number advantage fights and inject volatility, look for chaotic skirmishes. And so this is what's going to happen here. Initially, I want to commit to this fight up here. And so I'm trying to, you know, get the pick on them, but I just can't quite catch up. And, you know, maybe they're not necessarily out of position here. And so eventually they go from kind of out of position and now we're out of position, right? We're kind of stuck on top side here and we're a bit low. And so here's going to be another kind of ebb and flow. <clears throat> so first I just make sure that I can land my stun against the Darius after Riven stun. And then I have my E here to disengage as a team if we need it. And now it kind of shifts into the other direction. So now maybe we're slightly... Uh, in an advantage spot and then our Riven gets chunked and so this is a very messy skirmish. It is very important for uh, me to make the most of my cues and so that initial cue I made sure that I found a stun onto the Darius. This next little skirmish here I'm only going to get one cue. I need to make the most of it and so once I find um, an opening to find the stun onto the Felios who doesn't have flash then that's fantastic and so if I hold my cue and the Felios never follows up then Lee's kind of out of position. If a fellow is just trying to follow up and then I find a Q stun that can just shift the whole fight uh, in a split second. And so I'm being patient here. I'm waiting for that right time. If Felos is starting to get too aggressive, he gale forces forwards and now I just pounce on this moment. And then I know that, you know, Lee just uses W. If Felos has no flash, he used his gale force and this is the perfect time to find that Q flash double stun. And this can really just be the difference maker in an entire game, right? We were quite far behind. We get some shutdowns. We're in a fantastic spot now. And so a fight like this is really hard to plan out in your head. This is just, you're a playmaker, you're in a chaotic paced environment, and you're just um, trying to create number advantages and making the most of your spells. That's pretty much all you can do. But also at the same time, understanding um, the priority targets for the enemy team, right? I don't have my ult, but I still have my Q. I can still look to lock down the enemy of failures if given the chance. We're going to have a look at one more of my games before we move on to a few pro game examples. This is a great example of asking yourself if the enemy team is actually out of position or not. And I want to, I want you guys to picture yourself in the situation and what you would do and when you would pull the trigger. And so here I could technically, you know, engage onto the Nidalee and Renata, but they're not out of position. No one on my team can follow up. <clears throat> I'm only going to get one shot. And so I'm not going to use my engage tools right now. I'm not going to W back over the wall either. I'm waiting for my team to start to posture forward and to be able to follow up. And so I'm waiting, I'm waiting for that right moment. Now my team is really starting to wrap around the wall. I'm still not engaging forwards because I don't, I don't feel comfortable that my team can follow up yet. I'm waiting, I'm waiting. Renata uses her Q. My team is really starting to funnel through now. The enemy team's entering the choke and now I can get an engage on the backside. And so I don't really get as many of the enemies as I would have liked, but I think it's important to just have a look at when the enemy team actually is out of position and when they're not. And so if I did just engage, you know, randomly over here, um, I probably would have died. None of them would have died and we wouldn't have gotten, you know, the kills on the back end either. You get one engage as an engager, make the most of it. Okay, last example from this game. This is gonna be a little bit of that ebb and flow as well. Initially we're losing and then we start to be winning and I'm trying to find that one moment once again to look for that one bow engage. Tia flashes over, he's by himself, his teammates are collapsing, so I'm not feeling uh, confident in just engaging through here, that'll expose my team. My team's kind of getting chunked, they have vision on us with the TF ult, and so it's not the right time to look for an engage now. Fiora's dashing in, but again, she's just by herself uh, at the front. Now, Fiora jumps in over the wall, she uses her W, which is a big cooldown, and she's quite, she's committing quite heavily now, and now the enemy team is kind of forced to try and, you know, follow up on this. And once the enemy team is starting to group up around the wall here, now I flash swords, I pick my window to engage, and then I get a four-man combo, and I'm happy with how I used my cooldowns here. So even as soon as Fjord dashed over the wall here, if I engage right now, you know, maybe I just get Nidalee or Nidalee and TF. Again, I have one shot with my cooldowns. I want to get as big of an engage and as many of the enemy team in it as possible. <clears throat> so Fiora overcommits the enemy team, starts to try and help her, she dashes back over and now I, I pick my moment. I want to show what an example of a team fight, uh, the ebb and flow of it all can look like at the highest level. And so this was T1 vs JDG Worlds um, semi-finals that was played recently. 
And initially what T1 want to do is they want to engage onto the affiliates, right? They have Vi, they have Camille, they have Galio. They obviously really want to find a engage on a priority target. Even better, the affiliates has no flash. And so that's exactly what they look to do. And notice what JDG is doing in this situation. They recognize that the Philios is dead. They recognize that this is a losing fight. And so there's no point in trying to overcommit to try and help the Philios and then die as well. They cut their losses here. Um, you know, Lulu pops her Shirelias, the Viego ults away, and they're just trying to get out as much as possible. <clears throat> and then on the back end, Faker gets a little bit out of position. And so JDG, you know, they successfully disengaged and now maybe they can look for a pick on the back end. So Lulu slows down Faker and uh, Talia gets to shove and now Faker's out of position. And so now JDG find uh, confidence to be able to look for a pick on Faker. However, after Faker presses his Zonyas, now Faker is no longer out of position, right? JDG can't hang around for ages waiting for that to expire. Faker's team will help him. And so how this has ebbed and flowed... JDG, their ADC got caught out, they were disengaging. And then uh, the Galio got slightly out of position, they capitalized on it, used Zonyas, now they're looking to disengage once again. Faker looks to flash and make a play, and so the enemy flashes away, and now Faker's slightly out of position once again, and they're looking, right? They're once again assessing the situation very, very quickly. And so now Jax finds a window to potentially look for an engage. Great bubble on the Jax, and now Jax is out of position. And so now he needs to look to disengage, and then <laughs> once he flashes away and disengages, Vi is left in a bit of an awkward spot, and so now they get confidence to potentially look for picks on the back end once again. And so it's just this constant ebb and flow, making assessments of the fight as quickly and precisely as possible, and that's what can make for beautiful team fighting. All right, let's move on to game four of the series. I mainly want to have a look at the perspective of T1 for this initial fight. So um, Carrier on Renata wants to play front to back, right? That's what Renata and Enchanters want to do. And so there's going to be a bit of a dance around this area here. And notice that Carrier is positioning so that he is not in range to getting engaged on by the enemy frontline. He could easily start to position and run along this side, but then he would just be out of position. And so he is making sure that he has he can play around his frontline. And so eventually what happens <clears throat> is JDG are posturing awkwardly around this terrain, this choke, and eventually they get caught out. And so Carrier finds the Renata Q, throws out the ult, and now the fight is really hard winning for T1. And it's obviously really hard losing for JDG. So notice how both teams fully accept the state of the fight. They assess it very quickly and precisely. And so now T1 wants to chase and get as many kills on the back end as possible. While JDG want to lose as uh, few members as possible. And so what happens here is T1, um, they have some people chasing this way. And then you can see... Um, Faker and Carrier are posturing on the back end this to try and catch as many kills on the back end as possible. Carrier is even considering flashing over the wall here. JDG is just like running for the hills here. And so Faker, this is where he does the psycho flash over the wall to try and collect the kills on the back end. And so very precise and very quick um, in assessing the state of the fight. Is it winning? Is it losing? A moment's hesitation here or there by T1 and the back two kills over here just wouldn't happen. Now let's have a quick look at JDG's perspective and why this failed. And the main reason is that they can't get this front to back fight. You see their Jin and their Karma are split from the front line. And so the Jin and Karma, they need to be behind the front line to have that front to back or they can never really do anything. And so their front line either needs to force through here and try to create some space or they need to regroup all the way back here. But their front line and their back line is split up and so they just have no real foundation to ever fight like this at all. And so you can see their backline is they just can't really achieve as much as they want. Karma cannot ever really group up. Jin kind of like awkwardly uh, gale forces through the fight to try and find that front to back positioning, but this is just doomed. Thanks for watching everyone. I wish I had better examples to show you, especially for disengaged team fights, but we're just going to have to make do with what I have. Hopefully you can at least take these concepts into your team fights. Please consider liking and subscribing, but only if you enjoyed the video. And feel free to join my School of Support Discord server. We're a growing support community. For private coaching or for School of Support coaching and extra educational content, the links are all going to be down below in the description as usual. A big thank you to my current patrons for helping me do what I do full time. Goodbye, everyone.